So I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to be here and to discuss this paper. I think it's um, super exciting work, and, uh, and it is inspiring and poses a lot of questions in addition to answering a lot of questions. I'm just going to start, you know, Rosh did a great job going through a lot of material. I'm just going to start by summarizing the main points. Um, so first of all, that higher income is associated with greater longevity. Uh, we knew that, so the contribution here is to give us more details about what exactly the shape of that relationship looks like uh, using much better data than um, anybody else has, has used. Also, inequality in life expectancy at age 40, uh, that should be 40, sorry, and older has increased over this time period. And I, I'm going to come back to this in a lot of detail. Uh, I think a really novel finding here is that there's variation in life expectancy within income groups across commuting zones. So that was the, the second part of the presentation. And we, we saw this example, that for men in the lowest income ventile, life expectancy ranged from 72.3 years in Detroit to 78.6 years in New York City. Okay, so that's completely new. We had no idea that that was the case. Um, and Raj highlighted that areas with better health behaviors, especially less smoking and obesity, more exercise, have better outcomes for the low income. And um, on the other hand, there only seem to be very limited, if any, support for the hypotheses that contemporaneous measures of the quality of medical care uh, things like pollution, social cohesion, or inequality were related to the area level differences in life expectancy. And I'm going to come back again to this contemporaneous. Okay. So why are these results relevant? Again, uh, Raj gave us lots of, of good reasons. We know that health is a major determinant of work life. If people live longer and if they stay healthy, they might work longer. Uh, longevity determines the length of Social Security payments, Medicare payments. Um, there's concern that the low income are disadvantaged because they don't live as long, so they don't uh, get the same uh, payments over the same number of years as other people. This analysis suggests that those kinds of inequities are growing, so we might be even more concerned about that. And also, we need forecasts of life expectancy and retirement ages in order to forecast the fiscal health of these systems. Okay, so this is very relevant to everything people are concerned about here. Now, uh, I just want to emphasize that Rogers' work is such an advance over some of the work that's been done in this area. So this particular paper by Olshansky et al. in 2012 was the reason why I got interested in this topic, because there was this big write-up in the New York Times. I read the article, and I thought, this is terrible, <laughs> uh, and not just because of the headline. Okay, so the headline is, Lifespan Shrinks for the Least Educated Whites in the U.S. The result that got the most attention was this one right here. Um, so this is showing that for whites um, with less than 12 years of education, that life expectancy at birth is declining. And what the article neglected to say was that this is a vanishing group. So if you look at census data over the same period of time, you find that the number of people in that group fell by 66%. Okay, so that result about the shrinking life expectancy can be entirely explained by selection of people out of that group. Okay? So, so Raj's uh, study really provides important data and a useful corrective to, to that kind of perspective. It's useful for forecasting the longevity of those who are currently middle-aged. I'm going to argue that it may not be so useful for forecasting the longevity of people who are currently young. And um, I think an especially important finding is that some places that have the most inequality, like New York City, have the best outcomes for low-income people. So this is a really useful corrective to the idea that seems to be incredibly popular, that income inequality per se must lead to health inequality. And I think a lot of the reporting on this issue is driven by a deep belief that this has to be true. And uh, 
Raj has shown that it's not. It also suggests that policies can be pursued in order to improve the health of the low income, even in a world with rising income inequality. Those things don't have to go together. And it suggests that policies at the local level may have been really important in driving these results. So what I'm going to do is offer some observations uh, and findings that I think are complementary to those that Raj presented. And the, the main thing I would like everybody to take away from uh, these remarks, if you don't remember anything else, is the fact that the trends in inequality and mortality are starkly different for children than they are for older adults. And in particular, inequality and mortality is falling for children. Health of children has gotten way better over the last 20 years, and it's getting better faster for the poorest kids. And I, I think that's really important uh, in something that's been pretty much ignored in the public debate. Also, these improvements are especially dramatic for African Americans. So it's unfortunate that in the tax data you can't distinguish race, because I think if you could, you would, you would see uh, that there's really a lot going on for African Americans. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I'm going to argue that if you want to make a forecast about the health and longevity of today's ch children, you really have to at least adjust for the fact that today's children are much healthier than children uh, 20 years ago. And the, the basis of life expectancy as a measure is assuming that a child today, when they reach 45, is going to be just as healthy as a current 45-year-old. And I think that's a really bad assumption under the, the circumstances. OK, so I'm going to show you some results from, from a different approach using county-level data, where, uh, and this is work with, with Hannes Schwant, where what we did was just to rank counties from richest to poorest, and then to group counties into bins. So we're going to be talking about ventiles as well. But it's important to keep in mind these are ventiles of counties that represent uh, a 20th of the population. Okay. And then we do this for 1990, 2000, and 2010. So in each census year, we're considering mortality in the poorest counties and mortality in the richest counties. And then uh, we calculate three-year mortality rates in order to give us big enough cell sizes. What I'm going to show you as I mentioned, is based on ventiles. We've also done it using 1%. You can see it's sort of counties are lumpy, so it's hard to fit them into 1% bins. Uh, they're actually a bit lumpy trying to fit them into 5% bins too, but I think we do reasonably well with that. And then uh, this figure is kind of showing the main results. It's kind of a complicated figure, so I'm just going to try and walk through it. Along the x-axis here is the poverty percentile. So here's zero is zero poverty. 100 is 100% 100 poverty. Okay, so as you move along the x-axis, you're going to poorer counties. Uh, this is the three-year mortality rate. It's for age zero to four. We've also done this at much finer age levels, and you get very similar qualitative results. The different lines here, the blue triangles, are for 1990. The black dashed line is for 2000. And both the green circles and the red squares are for 2010. So why do we have two different lines there? Well, because uh, for calculating mortality rates, it actually matters a lot for kids how you treat the multiple race people. Interestingly, it doesn't matter that much for adults. But increasing numbers of children are being reported to have multiple race. So the red line here is including the people with multiple race in the denominator. So that would be black and something else, for example, here. And the, the green line is including only people who say that their only race was black. You can say that that makes a really big difference for mortality rates for black children. Okay, but regardless of the multiple race people, the story here is, uh, for example, if you look at white males, that mortality is falling more over this whole period for the poorest counties than for the richest counties. Okay? And so that's the basis for saying that inequality and mortality is actually falling, because mortality is falling more for the poor than for the rich. Okay? 
Uh, you can also see what, that there's really striking reductions for blacks, uh, both for black females and for black males in this age group. A lot of the reduction is between 1990 and 2000, so before Raj's period. But there's continuing reduction in the period from 2000 to 2010, even with all of the economic problems we were experiencing at that time. Okay. Looking at the uh, same kind of thing for age 5 to 19, you see the same type of result, especially for males. There's huge reductions in mortality among the uh, poorest counties compared to the richest counties. That reduction for whites is really big between 2000 and 2010. For blacks, most of it was happening between 1990 and 2000, but you still have a continuing reduction. Okay, so for children up to age 19, you're seeing pretty dramatic reductions in mortality and equality. Uh, for young adults, 20 to 49, we're being generous here with youth, uh, you, you see somewhat different results start to emerge. So for example, for white females, uh, doing it this way, you actually see increases in mortality rates between 1990 and 2010. Okay, that's the only group for which you see that. Uh, for black males, you see really big declines. Black females, you see declines. And for white males, you see bigger declines in poor counties and practically no decline in the rich county. Okay. And then if we look at older ages, so we're looking at 50 plus rather than 40 plus, but here you are seeing increases in inequality mortality for this older group. Okay. So looking, for example, at white females, this is showing a smaller decline in mortality in the poorest counties compared to in the richest counties. Okay, so even though this is quite a different way of looking at the data than from what Rush is doing, for that older age group, we're finding results which are qualitatively similar, i.e. increases in mortality and equality. But for children, you really find something very different. So um, this raises a question, though. If you see declines in mortality among the young, does that really mean that the survivors are healthier? I mean, maybe all that you're doing is keeping very low birth weight babies alive for longer and they would have died, uh, and then they might not be healthier. So what other kind of data can we look at? Um, one thing that one can look at is a number of papers that have been looking at the long-term effects of the Medicaid expansions to poor uh, children this paper is looking at child hospitalizations for uh, black children born after September 1, 1983. So on the left here are the cohorts who were born uh, in about four years prior to the, the change in the legislation, or who are eligible for insurance because they were born before the age cutoff. And on the right-hand side, you see the people who were eligible Okay, and you can see the sharp drop in hospitalizations that's associated with that cutoff. Uh, this is one of a bunch of studies that have come out looking at these long-term effects of becoming insured. And I think the way to think about it is these are kids who are insured basically from birth up until young adulthood, and they seem to be having much better health as a result than earlier cohorts. Uh, another paper by uh, Brown, Kowalski, and Lurie uses the tax data and finds that these kids are more likely to be employed and they have higher earnings uh, using the same kind of discontinuity identification strategy. Another piece of thing, information you can look at has to do with smoking. And I, I think it's interesting to think about smoking as a behavioral risk. Um, Raj was looking at contemporaneous smoking. When do people start smoking? Current smokers generally started when they were about 14. Okay, so this is, for most people, something that happened a long time ago. And also, I mean, the bad news for all you former smokers here is that some of the health effects go away when you stop smoking, but there are long-term health effects of smoking. Okay, so one way to think about um, smoking behavior is to look at people who ever smoked, which is what's done in this figure using data from the National Health Interview Survey. 
So if you look at older cohorts, what you see is a, a reduction in smoking over time. It's actually, if you look at men, bigger for men who are above the poverty line than men who are below the poverty line. Okay, so that might drive, that might be expected to drive some uh, decrease in inequality. If you look at women, though, it's, it's quite stunning in the sense that smoking rates were actually going up for this cohort over time. Um, that is, rates who ever smoked for women below the poverty line, whereas for women above the poverty line, they look like men in that their smoking, ever smoking rates were declining. Okay, so this crossover here by itself, I think, could generate increasing mortality inequality in cohorts of older women, right? Because more of the ones who are poor smoked when they were young and are suffering maybe the, the ill health effects of that. Now, uh, this here should say 18 to 40 year olds. If you look at 18 to 40 year olds, there's much lower smoking rates. Okay, and this didn't happen by accident. This was a result of very deliberate public policy, many public policies, increase in taxes, uh, the tobacco settlement, uh, smoking bans, anti-smoking advertising, you know, really concerted effort to get people to stop smoking. It actually seems to have had some payoff. Okay, so this is another reason to expect that future cohorts of these children when they age will be healthier than current cohorts. Now, uh, sort of one big picture reason why children are healthier is because we've been spending a lot more money on them. So this may be an example where you, you have a policy, you spend money to get something, and you actually get it. Okay? So what have we been spending money on? Well, a big ticket item is Medicaid. And here, I've made an effort to separate out uh, Medicaid for people in nursing homes and for the disabled from Medicaid for children and non-disabled adults. You can see there's a big increase in spending on that group. But there's also spending on many other social programs, such as the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, and even uh, state preschool. All of these programs, uh, with the exception of SNAP, actually have a local component. Uh, so they might be candidates to look at. Uh, also, they tend to be very correlated. So if you live in New York, you have generous Medicaid, you have generous EITC, you have generous preschool for children. Okay, so this might be one source of those differences. Okay, so uh, as a dismal scientist, I don't often get to come someplace and give good news. But I think there really is good news here, which is that even in a time of growing economic inequality, there were strong reductions in mortality among the poor. Mortality among poor children improved much faster than among rich children, which reduced inequality and mortality. And this suggests that the current young cohorts are going to be a lot healthier when they reach adults, adulthood than the currently middle-aged or old. Uh, I think it also suggests, although it doesn't uh, prove, that policy may be able to effectively buffer the health effects of poverty and growing income inequality.